Hello, folks. Welcome back to World War II TV and Shot Down Week, which we are talking about the POW experience, mostly in the EGO, but today we are venturing further east. I am delighted to welcome Holly Harris, a PhD student in Texas, to talk about the fate of Allied POWs, as I say, primarily on Eastern Front and primarily in the winter of 44 or 45. So I'll bring Holly in now. Good afternoon, Holly. How are you today? Good afternoon, Paul. I'm good. How are you? I'm very well. So the POW experience, as we got off to a, a, a cracking start yesterday with, with Dave and Tony, um, for someone, as we came up last night, of my generation, I grew up watching all the old classic movies, comics and things, isn't it? You, you're distinctly younger than me. You're on the other side of the Atlantic. How did your interest in the POW experience begin? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So my relative, Warren Gribbins, he was actually a prisoner of war for a little over 16 months in the European theater in World War II. And just growing up, I always heard so much about Warren's journey as a POW. My grandpa was very close with Warren. He talked about Warren all the time. I actually dragged him, dragged my grandpa to my kindergarten class to present about Warren. I was just so wow. inspired by his story and I was so patriotic about it. And I just love that he went through this and he survived. And not only that, that he left my family a written account about it in all his memorabilia. And I've also seen The Great Escape since I was a kid, and I really enjoy that movie as well. Well, that's, I mean, because Tony said that yesterday, because, you know, I, I, as we came up in that show, is we, we, I always wonder how much of that kind of traditional content people of different age groups have seen, because I can't imagine a world where anyone hasn't seen The Great Escape. <laughs> It seemed to be on every Christmas day, every Boxing Day, every Easter yeah. Sunday when I was a kid. And when it wasn't on, I had the video of it anyway. But so yeah. you know, it, it's part of me as a British middle aged man, part of our culture. But um, the POW experience, um, it, it was worldwide. And anyway, we're going to get up to your particular subject. I'll throw your PowerPoint up on screen. So, folks, we will do questions kind of as we go along, if they pertain to what Holly is talking about, but also allow some at the end as well. And I'm going to hand over to Holly to take us through her, her personal story. But also, uh, I've seen this presentation in San Diego, a version of it at the Society of Military Institute. It was really good. That was Holly's kind of, I think, was it your first public speaking thing? Yes, it was my first public presentation. Wow. And you've done anything since then? Uh, I have at the current conference I'm at at the University of Illinois and the theme is Sovereignty in Eurasia. So I've, I've chatted a little bit there, but that's about it. OK, well, we're welcome to you to, to, to World War II TV. And it's always pleasing for me to bring people from different stages on their history, history career ladder. I bring some very learned, quite elderly people on who are kind of uh, looking back on a 40 or 50 year career. But it's more exciting, I think, to bring people in who are at the beginning of a career. And we wonder okay. where the historiography is going to go and what you'll be bringing to the subject in 20 and 30 years time when we're all uh, retired and or, or in my case, possibly uh, dead. But anyway, well, hand over to you, Holly. But take us through your this this amazing story. Yes. Well, thank you so much for the kind compliments, and you know, I'm just excited to be here. I love history. I love that I get to do this full time. I feel very honored that I get to pursue this. Okay. So, um, like I said, we're gonna be talking about Warren Grivens and mainly the POW experience on the Eastern Front. Next slide, please. And then just kind of an overview of what I'll be talking about today. I'll be starting with kind of who was Warren and then kind of his collection and the items he left my family and then his POW journey, kind of the broader Eastern Front marches in context of what's happening in 1945. And then, of course, what happened after the marches, what happened legally, medically, personally. And then I'd love to answer questions as we go. Next slide, please. OK. So first, I just want to talk a little bit about Warren. He was born in Worcester, Massachusetts to a big Irish Catholic family. He was one of seven boys, actually. So, you know, just another two boys. They could have had their own bomber crew going. Yeah. Um, but he was a technical sergeant and he was also a top turn gunner. He was in the 384th Bomb Group in the 8th Air Force. And he was a prisoner of war for 16 months, which is a pretty long time. And whenever I talk about Warren, I just like to also mention that his brother was also a prisoner of war, but he was in the Pacific Theater and George was a POW for two and a half years. And unfortunately, he did not make it out of the Pacific Theater. He was actually killed on one of the hell ships that was torpedoed and he was in the Bataan Death March as well. So we don't have a written account of his story, but I always feel kind of his legacy and presence when talking about Warren or looking at Warren stuff and their letters and so on. Wow. Next slide, please. 
So I just wanted to include some items about Warren's collection that he left my family that I think really resonate. So on the left is a picture of his YMCA New Testament Bible, and it's obviously rugged and very aged, and he carried this with them throughout his entire time as a POW. So his Catholic religion was really important to him, and he writes that it did help him throughout his experience. And then on the right is kind of some more ephemera of his, and he kept his fork and his knife from his time as a POW, which I just think speaks a lot to the conditions he was going through and the lack of food that he thought to carry that and then display it and treasure that the rest of his life. He also kept the door plate from one of the camps as well. And then some of his other Western Union telegrams, and then also the Caterpillar Club card and the Caterpillar mm -hmm. Club was if you survived, get like if a parachute saved your life. So he's very proud that his parachute worked as well. I'm really fascinated to see the um, the knife and fork there because, and I'm sure you'll, this will come up later in the talk because the 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 quality of life in prison of war camps and rationing is very it was was key to survival, key to looking after everybody. And I remember one of the 101st Airborne guys who was captured in Normandy, Joe Byerly, who's a big part of the San Marie Glees Museum, he, after the war, raised his family to say that never take anything on your plate that you're not going to eat, those sorts of things. And is that something that kind of filtered down through your family, an attitude to food? I mean, I grew up with parents who were raised on rationing, so, you know, yeah. nothing went to waste. And, you know, my it's a joke in our family. My mum would call me in kind of beginning of December and ask how many potatoes I would want on a Christmas Day lunch. <laughs> but her... Her, not paranoia, but her, her yeah. idea of, 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 of doing too much of something and something being wa yeah. wasteful was, was part of her childhood. So did this seep down through your family? Yeah, I would say it definitely did, just to being mindful of all the food you're eating, because, you know, Warren and his brothers all served and they all dealt with the rationing and such. And so that's definitely been an important concept, which I, I'm kind of glad has trickled through because I think it is important to not waste food. Um, yeah, and then his he didn't talk about his experience much in his life, but it wasn't until the end of his life when he got more chatty about it. But he did stress, like, I want people to tell my story. I want this experience to be known. And I feel really lucky that my grandpa left Warren stuff to me because he knew Warren always wanted somebody to do something with it. And he entrusted it with me of, like, please tell a story. Please share this. Please work on this. So I feel very fortunate. And that must have been a great, um, it's not necessarily your starting point for yeah. the research, but having those physical yeah. items in your hand is a big, really good way of connecting you with the past because, you know, you are several generations away from, from yeah. the World War II generation, but having those artifacts and the ephemera in your hand must have been a really um, uh, big aid to that. And, and before you start going through the story, uh, there you are in Texas. How, how how was the research process? What 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 kind of archives did you use? What when when you're putting this together? What 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 were your sources? Yeah, of course. So the archives, I, I traveled quite a bit for the archives. I went to London. I went to the Imperial War Museum archives, National Archives at Kew. I was also in Poland for a bit. I was in New York City for the Gilder Lehrman archives there, and then I've also been to New Orleans at the National World War II Museum archives. And then I will be at the Air Force Academy archives this July. And then I'm currently at the University of Illinois archives uh, to get more materials related to this topic here. It's just such a, we'll get more into it, but such a complex and rich topic. And there's a lot happening in this time frame. And I feel like the more I read, the more I try to understand, I'm like, oh, the more archival material I need to really understand. What it is the natural habitat of a historian, isn't it? The, the yeah. archive, you know, going through lever arch folders and boxes and turning over papers, that is the bread and butter of being a historian. And, and <laughs> you know, and it's, it, 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 we're in an era where the, the oral histories of veterans is, is something where, as we're losing the veterans, it's, it's a whole marketing thing and books are coming out based on what people said, which are, can be fantastic, but without checking the details, without checking all the sources, it, it some of these some of these books can be a bit problematic. So I'm glad that you're rooted in actually checking things out in the archives because um, it prevents some um, uh, you know errors being repeated. But anyway, back to you and the presentation. I, I, shall I move on? Yes. Okay, and then here's a picture of Warren with his plane, the Geisel, and this was the plane that he got shot down in. Warren is in the top row, third from the left, so he was five foot seven. So little bit shorter than some of his mates. 
but this is kind of where I want to start a story of like how he came to be shot down. And so I'm just going to read a little bit from what he wrote about the experience. Um, so he got shot down on January 30th of 1944. Coincidentally, this was also the 11th anniversary of Hitler being chancellor of Germany. So I think that just kind of interesting juxtaposition. Mm -hmm. And he was flying as a top turret gunner for a bombing run over Brunswick, Germany. And the Giesel was one of 46 planes on the mission. It was the 8th Air Force 200th mission. It was the 384th Bomb Group's 56th mission. And it was Gribben's 5th mission. And also just kind of a change in January of 1944, we have Doolittle, of course, taking over command of the 8th in place of Ira Eaker. So unfortunately, the new tactics of the fighter pilots being able to go after planes didn't, didn't save him. But mm. also interesting contextual change. And then just kind of for some context on the statistics of airmen survival at this time, in the 8th Air Force, a crew's odds of surviving the first tour were only... 23% from December of 1943 through April of 1944. So still we're working with some pretty slim, slim odds of survival and flying. Okay, so this is from Warren's uh, journal. The static intercom then suddenly came on. As Staff Sergeant Edward Patsett said, tail gunner to the crew, 190s at about six o'clock. The comedy stopped as Gribben spun into action with 25 Focke Wolf 190s on their tail. The German fighters hit the tail, waist, and engines one and two all at once. Edward Passett's warning on the intercom would unfortunately be his last words as he was killed on that first pass. The plane's intercom system was shot up and communication was cut. The number three engine was hit, and as Gribbins later recalled, we were flying on one engine in a prayer. A scalding pain then rippled down Gribbins' right knee and hand as he was hit by a stray bullet. Still, he kept firing and managed to shoot down two of the six total 190s his crew shot down. A fire blazed from the radio room to the tail of the right wing. Gribbonson looked out, said a prayer, and dived out head first through the bomb bay doors. He was free falling 15,000 feet before he broke through the misty clouds at 5,000 feet. Gribbons later wrote, you were supposed to be able to tell the difference between a cow and a horse before you pulled the ripcord. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Immediately, he felt a sharp jolt, and he thought his body had snapped in half, but he had landed successfully on German soil and officially became a prisoner of war. And he would be one of three men out of the 10 total in the crew who survived the crash, so not too many. Next slide, please. And we just had a question about whether or not his age and whether or not he was married. Did I, if I've missed that yes, already. Yeah. So he was not married at this time. He was young. He was 21, 22 years old. Um, his his brother, George, who was in the Pacific Theater, he was pushing more 37, 38. He was still unmarried, but you can you can kind of sense they, they had a big age difference, Warren mm. and George. Thank you. Yeah. So upon being shot down, um, which you can see, it, it was a, he got shot down around central Germany. And then after going through, of course, Duelag Luft, which is the infamous kind of interrogation center and processing intake that all the POWs went through, um, he was taken to Stalag Luft 6, which is in Lithuania, which is in the upper right-hand side of the map up there. Yeah. And at Duelag Luft, um, he was he was in solitary confinement for around two weeks, which is a little bit longer than most people. Most people had 10 days or less. But he writes that he didn't give up any information and that it was all good. And then Stahl Gloof 6, I'll just touch on briefly, but the conditions were pretty decent at Stahl Gloof 6. Um, he writes that they even did ice skating in the winter and other people have corroborated this, which I thought was pretty interesting. And they had different theater camps and the Red Cross parcels were, were fairly decent. And then kind of moving forward in time, one year later on July 15th, they were transported from Stoglyph 6 to Stoglyph 4. And if you could go to the next slide, please. Oh, next slide after that. So I just kind of wanted to give some context for why they were moved on July 15th of 1944 from being so far deep in into the Eastern Front 
Um, obviously, the tide is turning for the Germans. D Day yeah. just happened June 6, and they're like, okay, we need to start keeping our airmen POWs more closer to Germany because we don't want the Russians to get a hold of them. And so they decide to move them. And then also kind of key after they were moved from Stogluft 6 to Stogluft 4, um, there was a Stauffenberg assassination attempt, which is, of course, the famous briefcase bomb with Stauffenberg to attempt to kill Hitler. Stauffenberg was actually in charge of the POW affairs. And this made Hitler even more paranoid than he already was about what was happening with his inner chancellery, inner chancellery and his command. And so the POWs moved from being in charge of the Luftwaffe more and more in control with Stauffenberg into the SS, now being in charge of POW affairs from October of 44 until the end of the war. And SS Gottlob Berger, he, he was in charge of that. So I think that's also just important mm. thing when talking about POW treatment in this last part of the war. Yeah, no, definitely. If I just point back to that journey again, because yeah. in in the sort of early part of 44, so obviously pre the yeah. pre things you just mentioned, how did the Germans ha decide where to put people? Was it a quake yeah. sort of putting people to where there was space in camps yeah. or was it a particular protocol? What What's your research led, uh, uh, concluded? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So actually the airmen, which all airmen were at Stag Luft camps, they were predominantly on the Eastern front and the Germans really prioritized keeping them far away from being able to escape because obviously on the Western front, it's much easier than we know there were active resistance lines like the Comet lines and a lot of groups attempting to get people out and doing so fairly successfully at times. However, with the airmen, there's a lot of stigma. There's a lot of hatred as well for the bombings that they're doing across Germany. And so they really prioritize isolating them, which I think is very interesting. And then also an important point, I guess I'll just make the Stog Luft 6, Stog Luft 4, these were all non-commissioned officer camps. They weren't like Kolditz, you know, or, or yeah. Stog 1, which, which were more officer camps. Um, so NCOs or the non-commissioned officers, they also did not have to work like officers did. Um, so they were similar in that regard, but they didn't have the hierarchy of authority when running the camps. It was much more uh, democratic and much more of a meritocracy. You, you would vote, all the men would vote. And it was, I've read from accounts of 80 to 90 percent of people had to all vote for the same thing in order for it to happen. Uh, any changes in leadership or representation. So. That's just kind of something that's a little interesting about the NCO camps of the Stalag. Wow, group. and I didn't know that. And just one other point I want to bring in yeah. that is that the Germans, we, we know that throughout the middle part and the other part of the war, they're desperately short of skilled pilots themselves and navigators yeah. and air crews and U-boat crews, things like that. So I suppose it's in that they also realize how, you know, perhaps if, an, if a captured infantryman from 1940 was to escape from a prisoner of war camp and get back to Britain, he just joins a regiment of, of 800 people or something. But if a, if a member of an air crew manages to escape and gets back, they can be back in the air with another air crew doing much more damage to the German war effort than a, than a, than a sole infantryman. So I, I'm guessing that's part of their, their, their rationale for getting airmen as far away from opp opportunity because they realize how, how valuable these commodities were. Exactly. You're precisely right. And you summarized that really well. And then that's also kind of building this tensions as we enter into 1945 and, and the POW treatment that's about to ensue. Brilliant. So which side will we do on that? This, okay, uh, yeah. We haven't stopped on that one long, have we? Yeah, yeah okay. that would be great. Um, so I just have some pictures of the different camps I'd mentioned below, just for reference, if people were curious what that looked like. And I'll kind of pick up uh, Warren's story of now being at Stahl Luft 4. Uh, Stalag Luft 4 was not a great camp, you know, it's kind of following this trend as, of worse conditions as, as the time gets on and the Germans get more desperate and things just get more, more chaotic. Um, so at Stalag Luft 4, there's approximately 7,000 Americans and 1,000 British, and they really have to fight to get their representation while they're at Stalag Luft 4, because there was um, an event known as the Heidekrug Run from six to four, which was a bayonetting of the POWs as they entered into the camp. And they actually stole all their packs and packages and took all their food. But luck luckily the International Red Cross actually was able to intervene after the event happened. And they were able to talk to the camp commander and get the Red Cross parcels to people 
and also their packs and tokens and religious items back to them. So I think that's kind of just an example of like kind of an amazing uh, wow. system that the internet, that the Red Cross was able to intervene after that event and help them at Stalagluft 4. Anyway, now they get moved from Stalagluft 4 out into a variety of other camps when it comes down to January of 1945. We once again, the front line's closing in the Eastern Front. We have the Russians advancing. The East Prussian Offensive has just started January 13th. You know, the Russians are very easily taking over Poland. Auschwitz just got liberated. Big things are happening in Poland. And of course, the Germans want to hold on to their POWs as potential bargaining chips. And so they're like, okay, these airmen POWs, we need to get these guys out. We might need them near the end of the war. And so kind of the series of of mass evacuations of all these camps on the Eastern Front starts to happen. And so some of them were, were very short evacuations. They lasted a day or so. I, I believe from Stalagluft 3 was actually a very short evacuation. Um, but at Stalagluft 4, it, it was quite much longer. And they also evacuated over multiple days. And so it, it, it varied kind of how extreme your experience was depending on what day you evacuated. Luckily, Warren was evacuated on January 30th of 1945. And so his, his experience, while, while still awful, not great, is, is less worse than the evacuation that happened the next week on February 6th. All right. OK. And do we yeah. know um, uh, in those camps at that time how much yeah. of the big picture these camps knew? I mean, obviously, there yeah. was a certain amount of communication with guards and things like that, because we know out in the Far East, for example, there's, there were... Yes. Even long before the end of the war, there are rumors in prison war camps that the Japanese were going to slaughter all the all the com yeah. uh, captives. And so, do we know what kind yeah. of um, information was going around? How much yeah. they knew about the war generally at this period? Early yeah. 45? No, it's a great question. So they definitely knew about D-Day. They, you know, they had radios that were sent to them by MI9 or MISX, which is the American counterpart to MI9. So they, they knew D-Day happened. They knew the Hitler assassination attempt. Many of the men write about that in their primary camps, how exciting that was and how much of a great day it was that they had almost killed Hitler. Um, but they were very much in fear. They also knew about Stalagluft III, that that had happened as well. A lot of men write about that. At right. Stal yeah, which I think is super interesting. And that led a lot of men to write that we've stopped all our escape attempts because... Mm. Yeah, which is super interesting because actually at Stalagluft 6, they were they had tried building a 300 foot long tunnel underground, which is quite extensive and, and everyone stopped production. They're like, we don't want what that happened to happen to us. And wow. so what was it? I just, wow. No, no, yeah, so yeah. I just I just made a, a, an exclamation. Oh, communication. Yeah, of course. They they did have fears in January of 1945 because they could hear like the Russian artillery. They knew they were close. And they were hoping for liberation at Stalagluft 4. They were like, the Russians are like 10 to 15 miles away, extremely, extremely close. You know, maybe this will be finally we get our freedom after so many months of being in captivity, what that does to the, the mindset, the mental health was not good. You know, food conditions weren't stellar and, and they were ready to get out. And so a lot of the men were really disappointed, like, oh, here we go. Now we're going to get marching. And it's funny about the marching as well, because a lot of the airmen, right, they're like, we signed up to be in the Air Force to not walk. Yeah, you know? we don't do walking. Yeah, we don't. <laughs> no walking. Yeah, that's why we didn't sign up for the Army. Wow. Yeah. Um, and they were afraid. They they didn't know if they were all going to be executed. Some men write about that. They were feared that Hitler just wanted them all gone, wanted them all dead. Um, they could feel like the anti-airmen sentiments, like the, with the Heidekrug run that was done in retaliation for bombing. So while the men were being bayoneted as they entered into Stalagluft 4, they were being told, remember Frankfurt, remember Bremen, remember Berlin. That's what they were being shouted at with. And just all this anger about the bombings was taken out on them. Um, so they knew Hitler didn't like them. They knew there was a lot of sentiment against them. And they, they were worried about lynchings as well upon landing, which is a whole other topic. Um, so, yeah, so they were worried that these marches might not lead anywhere, let alone will we ever leave this camp. But mm. thankfully, you know, they were able to march. The Germans thought they were more, more dead than alive, I guess. And so they do keep keep them going. And but so you want a bit more context as well. For, so we, we, is that is that the next slide now? 
Yeah, so perfect. And so I'm just going to focus on Warren's march and, and Warren's journey. You know, maybe another time I could talk about the other ones, but I'll just keep it focused on Warren. And so he was evacuated on January 30th of 1945. He was put into a boxcar where he waited for three days, um, since obviously the German rail system is going downhill at this point. In these cattle trucks, all the men were very much crammed in, you know, 80 men to a car, and they were meant to hold 40. So it was standing room only. There was barely any light, you know, no food, water, bathroom, anything like that. And so once the rail system gets going, they actually end up in the Berlin marshalling yards, trapped in these, locked in these cattle trucks. And that's kind of why I included a picture of it, because you can see the bombing damage that's going. And that's the first time Warren experiences a real bombing, as he called it. And he writes just how kind of traumatic it was that the flares that were happening with the bombs made it look like it was broad daylight instead of midnight and that everything would shake in the cattle trucks next to him. And actually on the sixth day of, of being in the marshalling yards, the, the truck next to him was hit and, and it killed everyone inside. So it was a it was a pretty frightening experience being being transported, and just kind of some facts about the bombing going on at that time. The U.S. Army Air Force dropped approximately 600 tons of bombs on German rail yards every month from September 44 through April 45, and from September 44 until VE Day, the U.S. Army Air Force actually dropped more than twice as many tons of bombs on marshalling yards than any other target. And it wasn't until May 1st that the Allied governments would place restrictive rules of warfare engagement on Allied bombers. And so one scholar even estimates that a thousand American POWs died because of Allied bombing during this last season of the war, which is pretty- Wow, cool. I mean, I, and that, that, I was gonna say something about the irony of, of, of him, Warren, now seeing the, the results of the 8th Air Force finally becoming the force it had been trying to be for two or three years. We're all waiting with bated breath for Masters of the Air when it comes out, whenever it's yeah. going to come out, and hopefully it will show that arc of the eight, of combined the combined bomber offensive starting out not quite being able to do what it was supposed to do and then gradually getting better and better and better and the losses reducing and becoming the force. And there he is, unfortunately, on the ground as a victim yeah. of... The mechanism that he was a part of uh, a, a year earlier it's it, quite extraordinary and also i was going to say how you not unique as the, the people who are with him as well but for, for people who, who are flying in, in in bombers they don't normally get to see what it's like on the ground during the result of it so he had a unique experience in that regard of seeing the power of what mass bomber formations can do Exactly. I mean, you're totally right. It's such it's such a unique experience to go from being the bomber to the bombed, um, especially for Americans, because obviously we never had the experience of bombing campaigns ever being brought to the home front. So it's also kind of one of the few Americans that's also really experienced the terror of bombing and what that brings. And yeah. so from the Berlin marshalling yards, he goes to stall 13D, which is in Nuremberg, obviously the infamous city. And this one was even worse conditions. And he writes, you know, we cleaned it up as well as we could, but we can never get rid of the rats, lice, and fleas, but at least they helped keep us warm, he writes, which I just think that little humor and how he writes is so interesting and, um, you know, how he tries to reframe things. And so at, at Stalag 13D, the POWs had no heat in their barracks. They slept on the cold, rough, damp floors. Half of the men got a bed, half of the other men joined Gribbons on the ground. And at Nuremberg, because it was right next to a marshalling yard, it was less than a mile away, bombs fell constantly while he was at this camp. He writes for 18 straight days, they were bombed day and night. And another POW at the camp named Moulton, he even logged 125 bombing raids while they were at Stalag 13D, which, which is just a lot. It's a lot. Huge numbers, yeah. Yeah. And so Warren, he writes, you know, the only thing you could do is lay on the floor and pray and that no one was ashamed of praying out loud. And he also writes that, you know, the air raid signs, they rang all day, but you become desensitized to them. And that kind of during the first 15 bombings, everyone stayed in the barracks and the German guards were very strict of, no, you cannot leave. You have to stay inside. But then as the bombing just didn't ease up, the guards let them dig their own ditches and, and you technically could go outside your barracks during the bombings if you wanted to and lay in a ditch and kind of cover your head and hope for the best. And luckily, you know, he was not struck by a bomb or people that he knows. 
he wrote that one time, one came very close, an RAF bomb in the dead of night. But it was lucky because that night they dropped the small bombs instead of the 10,000 pounders, which just, another again, his humor, his reframing mm. of the situation. And obviously mentally he writes how they had to hold people down because they were just screaming continuously during the bombing raids from running out and that you could kind of just see the city on fire. And he writes, of, if looks could kill, you know, he would have been dead a long time ago just from all that destruction and death of wow. just what bombing raids can do. And at, just at this point, sorry to interrupt here, Holly, at this point, had the, the relationship between the guards and the prisoners changed a bit? Because when they're in camps, there's very much, especially for in the earlier part of the war, what, you know, what Tony and, and Dave were talking about yesterday, yeah. when you're kind of safe from the, the war, it was very much a them and us. You know, the, the yeah. Germans are in charge and the prisoners are, whether you're American, British, whatever camp you're in. But in this experience, mm -hmm. the German guards are in danger of being killed by the bombs as well. Everybody is yeah. now in this ex shared experience of danger. So so did, was there a, a, a slightly more uh, case of camaraderie at this point? Yeah. Between, between I, I have not active? read a single case of camaraderie while they were at 13D, nor while they were at Stahlgluck 4, or, or, or maybe a little bit at 6, because it was an old pre older Prussian type of commandant who was in charge of that. But no, it wasn't. It was very much still, we are the guards. And it wasn't until maybe like that April 45, right when they're so close to liberation, that they actually had a change in guard. Um, and so the Volkstern, which is like the German home front guard, actually took in control. And it's all these older men. And they write, well, they were quite lovely. Like we had nice chats with them. Like they were they were good guards, quote unquote, good, good guards and were friendly. And they, you know, the local people helped give them food and such. But that's only in April when it's almost certain it's done for them that, that it changes. Mm. And Thank so, you. yeah, of course. And then kind of just another interesting statistic that I, I'd found from the United States bomb survey was that 91% of Germans interviewed by the United States bomb survey said that bombing raids were the greatest hardship of World War II for them. And I thought that was just kind of interesting that, you know, these POWs could commiserate with, with that. Mm, and definitely. then, yeah, and then on April 1st, it comes time to finally leave Stalag 13D. And so now they're going to commence on this 100 mile march south to Moosburg in Stalag 7, um, which is in southern Germany, as the map shows. And while the Geneva Convention states you can only march 12 and a half miles a day, um, they ended up walking sometimes 20 to 30 or so miles per day. It was, it was a very like, long and intense march to get them there. Um, and this was also a great opportunity for people to escape. So Warren actually tried to escape with his buddies, you know, Jack Scully and Jack Lark. Unfortunately, uh, they were caught um, three or four days into it. But for a brief moment, they had their liberation. And then they finally reached Stalag 7, which was just a, a massive camp. The photo underneath liberation is Stalag 7. It was designed to only hold 10,000 POWs, but in reality held close to 80 to 100,000 POWs near the end of the war, which is which is quite remarkable with just the overcrowding that's happening there. And then also from the German mindset, it's kind of interesting in what they were trying to accomplish with concentrating all the POWs at this one camp. There, people have theories about that, but that's, that's also interesting. And then on April 29th at 12.05 p.m., Gribbons and his fellow POWs were finally liberated by Patton's 14th Army Division. And the American flag was raised at 12.15 p.m. Like I have up there, Gribbons writes, you know, I never really appreciate our flag until that day, which I think is such a powerful line that he ends his story mm. on. And then next slide, please. So I kind of just wanted to touch upon the role of the International Committee of the Red Cross, too, with what's happening with all this POW treatment, because the uh, Red Cross was really in charge of making sure that they were getting their Red Cross parcels, that you know the Germans were treating them well, that they were getting representation and that conditions were being okay. So just kind of when reading about this experience in 1945, it's kind of like, well, what, what happened? You know, People generally think of German POW treatment as, as pretty great. And so it's kind of like, why is there this kind of gap in the understanding or story of what happened to POWs during this time? And so I think this is just a fantastic chart that's done by Vasilis Bukotius um, from his book, Prisoners of War in the German High Command. 
he actually tallied up the number of reports um, that the International Committee of the Red Cross had done. And you can see it just essentially stops in the winter of spring of 1945, these reports. And that, that's really when they needed it the most, this documentation of what was happening and these conditions that they needed fixed and the lack of food and the danger and such. Um, so I think that helped explain it quite a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the International Committee of the Red Cross could look after the POWs in, in Europe and in Germany, unlike in the Pacific was because Germany did sign the 1929 Geneva Convention, which protected POWs and gave them rights. And in Japan and Russia did not sign the 1929 Geneva Convention. So that's just kind of a key point and why the treatment was different, or, or at least how these nations could legally justify some certain types of actions that they were taking. And so, yeah, and so the International Committee of the Red Cross, they were in charge of that and they were just having supply chain issues, which is understandable in like a war-torn Germany, it's gonna be quite hard to infiltrate to get people the medic and food and supplies that they need. And, you know, ultimately all this falls upon Germany and their responsibility for the, the treatment of the POWs. But, you know, one could also argue that the allied governments could have been looking after them more and intervening more because they did have diplomatic communication, open communication with the Germans. You know, diplomatic options could have been taken, like POW exchanges, those were happening, but they did not occur during 45 or at this point in the war. Do you, I wonder, Holly, whether there's a sense, even within the allied command, that the war is going to be over soon. Yeah. So let's just kind of bide our time now we are, the, the, the yeah. period of uncertainty is gone it's just a matter of, of days or weeks to the end of the war now so so there are other things to focus on is that a possibility yeah i think that's a possibility from the communication that i've read between the grand alliance or, or just even staffers it seems like they anticipated that this could happen these marches these marches and this mass famine and lack of supplies but, you know, typical bureaucracy, it's kind of like, well, like, what can we really do? What can we plan? And it kind of just seems like the priorities were elsewhere, you know, like winning the mm -hmm. war. And unfortunately, um, it was it was like, we just hope they'll be OK. It's kind of the sentiment I got. Yeah, no, it makes sense. I'm, I'll move on. Yeah. Um, I'm glad I'm glad you're taking this talk to after the war, because I think so many um POW accounts I've read, the minute the camp gets liberated or the or the, the hero escapes, the story ends. And and it's and we we know from this channel in the past, we've talked about that post-war period of displacement camps and things like that, is that the 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 process of everything going back to normal took months, if not years. And so I'm I'm glad you're you're bringing this part up uh, in in this because it's important. Yes, no, I agree. I think it's also really important. And just when reading it, it's like you want to know, well, it's like, well, what happened next? So unfortunately, no one was successfully prosecuted or held accountable for these large scale marches or conditions in this last period of the war in 1945. Um, you know, there's different theories on why that happened. Some people write that, well, it was so varied the experience of the marches and of the conditions that you couldn't really create a cohesive legal case that people really understood. Some people are like, well, you know, enough people didn't submit reports. Other people are like the, spe the specific Germans being accused, they couldn't find them, they couldn't trace like the guards and therefore they couldn't bring them to trial. Um, it's probably a combination of all of those, but it is interesting that the British government maintains to this day that the, that the marches were the result of individuals and not the German government. Um, even though it was so large scale, I mean, it, it really, to me, only points to the government. Um, so yeah, so for in terms of the Nuremberg war crimes trials, everyone got off. The head of POW affairs was charged, but he wasn't convicted of his role related to the marches, which is interesting. And then in terms of health issues, like I said, because there's this lack of documentation from the Red Cross during this period of the war, I've read quite a few accounts where the POWs mentioned that they had a really hard time actually getting their health covered by the American government. So that was kind of specific American issue, which was pretty disheartening to read about because people were like, well, how do we know that you got this on this march? How do we know that you got this from this camp? And then also just the chaos of being liberated. People weren't always sorted 
through the medical doctors, you know, their weights weren't counted, their health wasn't assessed. It would just kind of, we got to ship you off back home. Let's get you out of here. You've been waiting too long. And so once again, that kind of lack of a paper trail kind of hurts the Americans. And I haven't found too much information about any comprehensive or extensive repatriation schemes or or just de debriefing programs that the American POWs got. The British POWs did have an option to kind of go to these civilian resettlement units with other POWs, which I think was quite a great idea, quite a great plan. And they mm -hmm. had very close access to psychiatrists and to therapists to help them as they kind of resettled back into civilian life. Um, so that's just kind of interesting British American. Just a counterpoint to your, your comment there about yeah. the, the American military maybe not always doing the paperwork that was necessary. Yeah. I remember it wasn't the POW, but a 101st Airborne guy and you called Charlie Ekman, who was enlisted at 17. At the end of the war, he, he'd been wounded like 12 times over the course of 18 months. He was so keen to get home to see his mum and the, and the medical people he was meeting were, were, were listening to his, I just want to go home and see my mum, I just want to go home, is, is that he was pressuring them to let him go through the system fast as well. And then later on, and I'm talking like 40 years later, when yeah. he was beset with health problems, he wished he'd been through the system better to have his various wounds and things uh, analyzed better back at the time. So he he held, he held some something of a grudge against the, the military for not performing the checks on, but he also admitted he was pushing them to rush him through it. So I wonder whether that would also, you know, if you're American me medical order and you're yeah. meeting a guy who's been a prisoner of the Germans for, in your, you know, in Warren's case, so 16 months or something, and he just wants to go back home, but maybe you're not going to sit with him and make sure he fills in every single form in triplicate when he's busting to get on that C-47 or on that train and get back home. So I can kind of see it from both sides yeah. there. Exactly. No, you're totally right. That's a great point. People want to get home. It's like, oh, this paperwork's not that important right now. Like I got other priorities to do. Um, but yeah, I would love to look more into that health, health issue aspect. I think that's an area that should be studied more. And then just kind of touching upon the benefits of the GI Bill, and, you know, for America, at least in Warren's case, uh, he did use it. He would actually go on to get his PhD from Harvard in psychology, and he would be a psychology professor the rest of his life. So I also think that's quite interesting to go through this psychologically really difficult experience and then spend the rest of your life end up teaching psychology. Um, mm. Yeah. And, and that was, do you think he, he, he yeah. I wonder whether that's got any connection with, you know, in these camps, uh, and yeah. this is my experience, but you, within a, within a hut, within a barrack, you know, you'd, people would kind of, appoint themselves to roles you know he's the cook he's the son so do, do you think warren was maybe one of the kind of the people who would even though he was very young himself yeah. give others advice or analyze things do you think there was the element of him kind of doing that work during the war yeah i i could see him doing that you know i know that they had active libraries a lot of the pow camps and, and a lot of men would would spend a lot of time reading so there could have been a spark for education there um, earlier in the war before beginning of 1944 and, and before I actually read accounts of that you could actually take qualifying exams and get certified like legit legitimacy certifications in a trade or in a job while in a POW camp. So you could study all day for these exams, send them into Switzerland and get your certification, which is quite incredible. So I think there was like a culture of knowledge and and learning before the camp conditions got worse. That, that could have been really important in his journey. Brilliant. Yeah. And then that that was kind of all I had, and, unless there's some questions. Well, I'm sure there will be. And um, I mean, it's one of those present. I thank you very much. It was it was it was brilliant, as I knew it would be. But it's one of those things that I can see that there's many potential rabbit holes of investigation for you. I'm glad you're tackling this at a nice young age because I can see you're occupying your work for the next 30 or 40 years because I, I'm feeling there's not as much studies on this aspect as there are the, 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 what I would call, as we talked about last night, the traditional POW experience, the escapes, yeah. the, uh, the, the and, and again, the British focus so much of the POW experience has been and, and also the officer class as well. So um, I, I'm sure some questions will come in uh, on, on the sidebar in a minute. But in the meantime, I'm going to ask you, where, where are you taking this next? People are already asking, are you going to do a book? Um, what, yeah. what's, your, what's your focus? Yeah, you know, I would love to work on turning this into my dissertation. I've already been working on this the past year and a half. And like you said, there's so many rabbit holes. There's so much still to uncover and to learn. Mm 
So I would love to turn it into my dissertation and then and then into a book, just because I would love for people to engage with this material and these stories that I find so interesting and so relevant and just bring up some questions that I think people would like to chew on for a little bit. No, definitely. So we've got a question from Lisa about keeping morale up. So particularly yeah. on the marches, I mean, and yeah. you've, you've read some of, the, of, of Warren's experiences there. Yeah. You know, when, when there's a certain amount of uncertainty about where you're going and whether or not yeah. you're even being taken anywhere, yes. that's the kind of situation where morale could rapidly spiral downwards uh, if there isn't someone there being a bit sort of chirpy and optimistic. So is there anything he wrote about of, of how how they kept themselves focused on thinking and thinking positive during the, particularly during the, the marches? Yes, no, that's a great question. Um, I would say the predominant number one thing, and once again, I, I probably have read 40 to 50 accounts of men who were at Stahl Glue 6, then Stahl Glue 4, and kind of went on this whole journey the thing that comes up the most consistently is that they had two mates. They had two best friends that they were like, these are, these are my guys that I'm going to share my mental health with. We're going to share food. We're going to share our blankets. And they're, they're going to get me through the end of the war. And so with marching, they would actually pretty consistently throughout the different marches, you would be in a group of three. And so one person would be like, I'm in charge of the blanket. Like I'm in charge of finding our space to sleep for the night. Another man would go forage, try to look for food or berries sometimes if they could, if the guards allowed it. And then the third man could try and bargain uh, to get food or materials or supplies with other men. So yeah, their, their mates were definitely the, the biggest part in their morale. And then second to that, I would say religion. A lot of men mentioned their Bibles, they mentioned praying, they mentioned singing songs as well. And so, yeah. I think, I mean, it's interesting because I, I remember that from the British books, I mean, there were always Red Cross Bibles, Red Cross diaries, Red Cross. They were they were trying to keep people's minds focused on 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 things beyond the camp, I guess. So yeah. the question from Soylent Green, were you already into history or was this personal story your spark that got you interested? Yeah, no, I first of all, I love the name Soylent Green. What a great movie. It's yeah. <laughs> to get older one, but I love it. Um, I've always been interested in, in history. It's so nerdy ever since I was a little kid. I've just loved it. It's like, you know, six, seven, eight, and I'd ask for history books for Christmas, which is might have alarmed my parents. So it's like, oh, she wants these Roman history books for Christmas. What kind of a kid? Uh, I, I, a lot of people watching know exactly what you're talking about because most <laughs> of the people I know in my life are very are very similar. Um, yeah, history just gets under your skin. And uh, although yeah. I didn't like it at school, my my teachers were, were were terrible when I was a kid. But I I did it I did it on yeah. on my own uh, accord. So a question from Eric there: Were you able to get Warren's military and medical records, or did they go up in the 1973 fire at the record center? I'm really lucky that I was able to get Warren's military and records files. Um, and they're also digitized on ancestry.com, a lot of files related to him as well, which is quite nice. Um, yeah, no, I'm fortunate in that regard. I will say um, during the bombing of Berlin, the main records center for POWs was in Berlin. And unfortunately that burned down in that last part of the war. So there is a gap in records there quite unfortunately, which is why kind of this bottom up perspective and stories and accounts are, are so important for trying to understand. No, no, definitely. Thank you. So Peter O'Connor is asking, thinking of Stalag 17, another great movie, what sorts of contraband and black market economy existed in the camps? Yeah, no, great question. So for contraband, you know, cigarettes, by far the main one. And it's funny, I've read some accounts of men who didn't smoke. And they were like, I was so wealthy. Like, I've never been so happy. I was a non-smoker. And they were like, I was able to buy soap and clean myself and, and just stay good. But yeah, cigarettes were definitely the main one. And they kind of talk about like even in any market economy, once they were rationed out a Red Cross parcel and kind of this mass influx of cigarettes came in, that the men who had been hoarding cigarettes were like, oh, now these are worthless, you know, for now, because everyone just got Red Cross parcels and more cigarettes and people won't want to trade for me. Um, so yeah, cigarettes by far number one. People didn't trade, I would say, as much with food. I feel like normally it was more collaborative and you were going to share that. Okay, thank you. We got another one from Soylent Green. Are there any books you all recommend about World War II POWs or favorite World War II books you've read in general? Uh, and hopefully we will have a book by you one day. So any particular POW books that you, I mean, I mean we can always add the, 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 the titles to the description later on, but any, you know, one or two that leap out? Okay. 
Yeah, no, I've, I've read a lot of really good ones. I think it depends on what you're looking for in a POW book. I do really loved barbed wire diplomacy. I think that's just such a great historical account. It's a little more nitty gritty in the depths of kind of the diplomacy that was happening. But I, I think that's amazingly well-researched book. If you want kind of like a nice overview of all the different types of POWs, Bob Moore's Prisoner of Wars came out, I believe either this year or last year. It's a pretty thick book, but if, if you get through that, you, you'll have a pretty good understanding of all the different types of POWs there. And then in terms of just personal enjoyment, I mean, just Donald Miller's Masters of the Air, you can't, you can't beat it. It's a, it's a great book. And thank you for the nice compliment as well. No, I'm sure he's, he's, he, he, everyone means it. So um, question from Jay White there. Did the Soviets have custody of any Anglo-American airmen after overrunning camps? If so, how was that handled? Yeah, no, thank you, Jay, for that question. That's a great point. So there were some Anglo and American POWs that the Soviets did get a hold of as they were coming towards liberation. And it, it was quite a quite a dramatic, complicated diplomatic affair that ensued because right as the marches are happening, the new USSR borders for the next decades are being set. Um, so yeah, so there were no and luckily, the men were sent to Moscow and then sent back to either the Commonwealth, Britain, or America. So they were able to get back, luckily. But there was this tension in negotiations and diplomacy of how are we going to get these men back from the Russians? Okay. Well, I, I think that's probably it from viewers. But I've got a couple more for you just to keep you on your toes. One is... Um, do you think there's any fundamental differences between the American POW experience and the British Commonwealth experience that, you yeah. know, the Iowa, is, is there anything that you can leap out and say, yes, this is definitely different, or do you think it was broadly similar? I, you know, it, it's interesting. I would say overall it was broadly similar. I mean, I've read a lot. I mean, a lot of the, I've read a mix of American and British, and they do mention kind of differences between the British and the Americans. Um, it seems like the British were more organized and they actually helped teach the Americans a lot about this is how we run a camp, this is how we deal with administration, that type of thing. Um, there was sometimes kind of some tension and kind of resentment about issues with Red Cross parcels because the American Red Cross parcels would become more frequent and easily than the British. And so they had to like make a deal that like, no, we're going to treat everyone the same. Doesn't matter if it's American Red Cross or British Red Cross, everyone's going to get a parcel and we'll figure it out. So there were some tensions there. The British also, I've read, noticed kind of a difference between Americans from the North and like the South, kind of just some issues there. But I, I would say overall, like in terms of the broader things that's happening in the lifestyle, it's pretty similar, but obviously the British had better camaraderie with the British. They wanted to be with other British. They, they didn't usually want to be housed with the Americans if they could, didn't have to be. And the Americans kind of stuck with themselves as well. Okay. And my last question I think is going to be, is there too much an obsession with the POW escape story? Because, you know, as Dave and Tony said last night, you know, yeah. very, very few really of the prisoners in any of the camps were actually actively involved in escaping. So do you think, you know, when most, you know, we talk, you talked about the fact you have seen The Great Escape, you do like The Great Escape, that, you know, if you were speaking to an average American or Brit of your age group and they were knowing, aware of POWs, they would think about the escaping thing. Are, are we a bit burdened by that and, uh, 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 and not really focusing on the, on the kind of the hard of the POW experience? Yeah, I think the there is a little bit of an overemphasis on the escapes, but I mean, whatever gets people interested in POWs is like, I'll take it. You know, I just kind of want people to engage with the topic. It would be, it would be nicer as well if people would focus on other camps other than Stalag Luft 3, just because I feel like there is a lot of very interesting stuff happening at, at all these other camps. But you know, that's kind of like if people do know POW camps, that's the main one only people know. So if I had a wish list, I, that would be on there as well. No, thank you. Anyth and anything else in, you know, again, not emphasizing the fact I'm distinctly older than you, but anything else in your kind of work that you think that, that, that is, is, a, is burdening or understanding things, you know, from the old day, the old type of books, anything that you wish we would kind of drop as a concept and, and, and look at freshly? I, I, I do have a wish list and it does kind of relate to the difference in between the German and the Pacific experience. I think it's more nuanced than people make it out to be. Um, actually, I read a really interesting book called, called Death on the Hell Ships, and it was published by the US Naval Institute Press. And there's a really interesting statistical analysis in the last chapter, and it compares the death rates of German POWs to the Pacific POWs. And if you remove 
all the Pacific POW deaths that were caused by U.S. torpedoing these POW transport ships, that, that it would be equal, the death rates between the wow. Germans. Yeah, which is, I read that. I was like, wow, how did not more people know about this or why wasn't this more publicized? Um, so I, I think there's more of a nuanced take to be done there. Well, the nuance, as we always say on this channel, is, is where the interest is. And we, we always tend to, to try and get get uh, to the extremes. You know, we, we talk about the troops being elite or awful or tank being brilliant or terrible or, or, or POWs escaping or not escaping uh, or yeah. the, this being the worst or this being best. I think, as is always the case, the truth is always somewhere in the middle. And, and that's that makes it fascinating. So I think we will bring things in there. Holly, it's been absolutely amazing talking to you. People are saying it's great to see someone not we're always bang on about the fact you're younger than most of my guests, but you are younger than a lot of my guests. And it is great that people are picking up the mantle and, and carrying on the work because uh, uh, it, it, it's great to see. So um, we, we know you're going to continue working with this. I hope you, you, you will be maybe paths will cross again either at a conference or you'll come back onto world war ii to be with another subject in the future that'd be great if you did yeah i would absolutely love to come back on thank you so much for having me and thank you to everyone for listening if you know people can always follow me on twitter send me an email and i'll be more than happy to respond Brilliant. Well, I'll just take you off screen for a second while I tell people about tomorrow, and I'll bring you back and say goodbye in a second. So, folks, tomorrow evening, Steve Darlow, so one of the old, you know, the, the, the old hand military experts is coming on. Steve's been writing books for about 30 years about the, uh, the flyers and the RAF, and he's going to be telling the story of two of the last Kriegies, so the two of the, the last bomber command veterans who were who are prisoners of war and telling their stories tomorrow. Then we've got two more shows, both with history. Everyone else this week is a Steve. There are three Steves coming your way, so I'm not going to get... Uh, confuse which one is which steve tomorrow steve thursday steve friday if you're new to the channel or if you're not new to the channel don't forget to click subscribe don't get, forget to click the bell so you get notifications and the description below contains all the information you need and maybe you consider becoming a patron or channel member but i'm gonna bring back holly just to say uh, thank you very much so enjoy the rest of your day holly that was a great fantastic debut performance and again i hope to see you again sometime thanks everybody for watching um this is paul Wood from world war ii tv saying enjoy the rest of your day cheers everybody bye Bye.